Th spoilers for all of these movies. Spoilers for all of these movies. Welcome to the behind the scenes for the thumbnail for this video. I just want to make it very clear that my car is off. It is not in motion. I am not drinking and driving. Welcome back to Drunk Ranking, where I drunk tweet a series of movies, and then I get drunk and talk about them on camera. Over the past several weeks, I have been drunk tweeting the Fast and the Furious franchise, and I am here to rate them all for you today. I want you guys to appreciate how committed to a bit I am. Like, I, I had Guinness for the Leprechaun review, because Guinness is Irish beer, but Guinness is good. I like Guinness. Corona is probably the shittiest beer I've ever had. It's also only important in, like, two of the movies, so... I don't know. I don't know why I did this to myself, but... Haha, -ha, it's Corona, like they drink in the Fast and the Furious movies. Dom's favorite beer is Corona. The last movie to come out before 2020 was about a virus. Corona... Virus? Coincidence? Anyways, as always, we're going to be starting with the worst film and working our way to the best film, so let's get right into it. The worst Fast and the Furious film. <laughs> Tokyo Drift honestly feels super out of place in this franchise. <laughs> like, the franchise has just started, and all of a sudden you're giving us a movie with, like, none of the characters from the previous films. Like, Dom doesn't show up in Too Fast, Too Furious, and I was kind of surprised by that. I'm like, oh, it's it's the second film, and you've you've already done away with Vin Diesel. But it, it is still about Brian O'Connor. It's still got Paul Walker in the lead, so it does still kind of feel like a continuation of the first movie. If you told me someone had written the script for Tokyo Drift for something completely different, and the studio just went, ah, slap the Fast and the Furious name on there, I believe you. It it doesn't tie into the other movie, or it it doesn't tie into the first two movies really at all. Dom makes a cameo at the very end, but otherwise, this is this is a completely detached movie from the rest of the series. And and I mean, Han makes his debut in this movie, and he becomes a recurring character in the series. And, and Sean even shows up. The main character, Sean, shows up two other times in this series, but it, it just feels really weird to to deviate this much this soon out of the gate. Apparently it didn't work that well because they went back to the main cast after this, but like, I, I could honestly see an alternate universe Fast and the Furious franchise that just, you know, every movie is about the street racing scene in a different country, right? The first two are about America, and then you get a, a, a Japanese one, and then maybe you get one about street racing in Mexico, or street racing in Brazil, street racing in uh, the UK. I suppose they do go all over the world in this franchise, but, like, street racing stops being an important part of the plot pretty quick. That's not why I put this at last place. I put this at last place because it's kind of boring, I'm, I'm not super interested in in this movie. There's just not that much to it. There's like a, a kid who keeps getting in trouble and getting in street races and he like wrecks another dude's car in a street race. So he gets shipped off to his uh, American GI dad stationed in Japan. I do think it's interesting that they decided to show off what, what street racing was like in other cultures, although the main characters of this film are still a white American and a black American, so... Eh, not that multicultural. Also, uh, an odd thing about the, the Fast and the Furious franchise is you can pretty often pinpoint when a movie in the franchise came out. It reflects modern trends well enough that you can kind of pinpoint when every movie comes out. And it, it's clear this was coming out, you know, mid-2000s when, like, 
Japanese culture was kind of a new thing in America. You know, like, people were getting real into, like, anime and stuff, and we, we, we were importing a bunch of, like, crazy new Japanese movies, and it's like, ooh, we gotta cash in on that. Let's set Fast and the Furious in Japan. Uh, they, they pull a bit of uh, Saw 3 with this movie, where, like, S Saw 3 killed Jigsaw, and then they had to, like, fuck around with the timeline so that made sense. Uh, they, they do that with this and Furious 7, although maybe I should save the bulk of the discussion of that for Furious 7 because that's, that's when it becomes actually relevant. Like, that is more the fault of Furious 7 than, than Tokyo Drift, but I'm still gonna complain about it a little. So they, they introduce a character in this movie named Han, and Han dies in the movie, uh, and then he, he shows back up in the fourth movie. He shows up at the beginning of the fourth movie. But the beginning of the fourth movie is clearly supposed to be a flashback because Letty's in it, and the plot of the fourth one is that Letty is dead. So you're like, okay, this is a flashback to, like, before Han had died when he was part of the team, right? But then he shows up in five and just continues being a, a normal presence. In the, he's in five, he's in six, and then uh, once seven rolls around... Then they show, like, the scene from Tokyo Drift happening. So apparently Tokyo Drift happens after 4, 5, and 6. Which doesn't make sense for a variety of reasons, but uh, we'll talk about those when we get to Furious 7. I, I only bring it up here because there's not really that much to talk about with Tokyo Drift. It is ultimately a, a pretty boring movie. They play a Kid Rock song in this movie, and they play the whole fucking song. They set an entire chase scene to this fucking Kid Rock song. So it, it gave me a chance to shit-talk Kid Rock on Twitter like a week before everyone else started shit-talking Kid Rock on Twitter. Yeah, that's how long I've been doing this. The, the, b before the Kid Rock controversy, I started this series. Anyways, Tokyo Drift is pretty dull. Not at all a noteworthy entry in the Fast and the Furious series. In fact, if there were one movie you could skip and still totally understand what was going on in, like, most of the other movies, uh, this would be the one you could skip. Not a fan. Moving on. Fast and Furious, which is the fourth movie in the franchise. That's really confusing, my understanding is they called it Fast and Furious because they intended for it to be the last movie in the series. Kind of the way Friday the 13th Part 4 was called The Final Chapter, even though it was not the final chapter. Or, or maybe it was just to note that, like, the Toretto gang was back in the series, I guess. Because yeah, they're back. Dom's back. Uh... It, for the first time since the first movie. Al although he does appear at the end of part three, like I said. He appears at the end of Tokyo Drift in a cameo appearance. And it's actually the first time he mentions family. He Like, some guy walks up to the main character and he's like, Hey, this guy so showed up. Says Han was family. And then, oh, it's Dom. It's Dom from the first movie. You remember the first movie. So this has one of the slowest top speeds of any movie, but it is on the more furious side. It's a revenge story. Letty is killed, but not really. Uh, so, you know, Dom is going after the guys that killed Letty. Spoilers, Letty comes back after, like, two movies, but uh, that's just kind of how this series operates. People die, and then it's like, nah, okay, but they didn't really die. So, I mean, it, it's a revenge film, and that kind of works, but I don't know. It's just not that interesting. It's, it's, just, it's just that. That's all there is to it. Like, Dom is out for revenge because uh, someone killed his wife, um, and, and she is his wife. That's revealed in the sixth movie, seventh movie. I forget, but eventually there's like, it's like a twist that they got married. Um, so spoilers, Dom and Letty were married. I, I gotta say, there's this cliche in action movie sequels 
where the love interest from the previous movie is either immediately killed off or completely forgotten about and not even mentioned. And uh, honestly, Too Fast, Too Furious does it by not having Brian mention Mia at all. But I kind of appreciated that this followed up on that. Like, Brian and Mia are back together, and they stay together. <laughs> and, you know, uh, Dom and Letty eventually get back together, and they stay together. Good for this series, I guess. That's, I, I guess, part of it is, like, I know Letty's coming back. I, I knew Letty was coming back already. Like, the, you can't you, you can't fool me into thinking she is permanently dead. I, I do wonder if people watching this in, like, 2008, 2009 were like, huh, I wonder if Letty is permanently dead or if she'll come back. But to me, it was obvious. To me, it was obvious Letty was coming back because Michelle Rodriguez is, like, one of the faces of this franchise. And to have her, to only have her in the first movie and a little bit of the fourth movie was like, nah. Nah, she's more important to this franchise than that. Yeah, I mean, some good action, I guess, but nah, this one is also pretty dull. It's a little better than Tokyo Drift, but not by a whole lot. Moving on. That's right! First movie of the series, bottom of the list. This movie is boring, okay? I don't know how they spawned an entire franchise off of Fast and the Furious. It is so dull. There's a cop, and he's trying to catch, like, the these guys who keep uh, hijacking 18-wheelers, and uh, uh, he, he, like, gets in with this street racing crowd because he thinks some of them are involved. And, uh, yeah, it turns out they are, but... Then uh, drama happens, he finds out, like, the criminals aren't uh, as bad as he thought they were, and uh, they, they're they all hunky-dory by the end of this. Yeah, it's, it's boring. It's boring. Like, Fast and the Furious is not really worth watching. Yeah, like, th this movie is so underwhelming. When you compare it to, like, the rest of the franchise. It, it feels, like, weirdly out of place in the series that it spawned. It, it's like how First Blood is not anything like the other Rambo movies. Although that's sort of a reverse example, where First Blood was really good and all of the Rambo sequels were stupid and bad. This is a case where the first movie is boring and everything else is way more interesting. I, just to give you an idea of how long this series has been running, the first movie is about them stealing a bunch of VCRs. That is the first job they pull off in this series. Stealing VCRs. Uh, there's, like, very little going on in this movie at all. It's just... I It's so, like, cut and paste that it's wild to me that such a such a bizarre franchise has grown out of it. Really, that's its most interesting aspect, is that this, like, really grounded, really normal, like, not noteworthy really at all movie has spawned, like, one of the hugest and wildest franchises of all time. That's what's interesting about this movie, is just, like, how how bland it is, and yet it gave birth to the Fast and the Furious franchise. <laughs> yeah, but ultimately, I, I don't know that I really recommend the first Fast and the Furious. I, I want to give myself a little bit of a pat on the back here. Across all of the drunk ranking videos, Ernest Goes to Camp is the only time the first movie in a series was at first place. I consistently rank the first movie in a series below first place. Uh, this might be the lowest I have ever ranked the first movie in a series, and it might be the last time I ever rank the first movie in a series this low, but man, Fast and the Furious is just not as interesting as its follow-ups. Speaking of... 
swinging way to the opposite end of the spectrum here. F9. That's just, they, they've run out of things to call, they, they've run out of weird titles. It's just the letter F and the number 9. Although, here it says The Fast Saga, but on, like, Letterboxd, it's just less listed as F9. The title card just says F9. The Fast Saga seems to be something they came up with after release. Uh, F9, as of recording, is the most recent installment of the Fast and the Furious franchise, so that's kind of interesting that the last movie would just be one spot above the first movie. And I think it kind of has the opposite problem of Fast and the Furious 1, where Fast and the Furious 1 is a little simple and boring. Uh, F9 is way too much. It's like... Uh, I, first off, you re it requires in-depth knowledge of, like, the other movies in this franchise to even get, like, half the shit that's going on. But on top of that, it's got too many plates in the air. There is too much going on in this movie. And that's just because the, the series just keeps stacking problems. So the deeper you get into the series, the more problems there are going to be. So by the time you get to the ninth movie, it's like, okay... No, hold on, this is too much. I need you guys to tone it the fuck down. Um, John Cena is in this, and he plays Dom's half-brother, who is like this big shot criminal organization head. The exact type of person Dom has just spent the last ten years fighting, and not once, not once has his half-brother who's been doing this very thing, been a problem in all of that time. Although, his brother is played by John Cena, so maybe he was there the whole time and we just couldn't see him. Um, Han comes back in this movie, like, after already undying for the fifth and sixth movie. He... This is set after he dies in Tokyo Drift, but then they're like... Ah, no, but wait, he was in cahoots with this character named Mr. Nobody that they've only known for two movies. And Mr. Nobody helped fake his death. It's just ridiculous. It's just, I don't know, this is a franchise that just loves to bring back its dead characters. Uh, Gal Gadot plays a character who dies in the seventh movie. S spoiler, uh, th spoilers for all of these movies. Spoilers for all of these movies. Gal Gadot plays a character who dies in the seventh movie, and I guarantee if she hadn't gone on to be Wonder Woman and is, like, way too expensive for them now, they'd have brought her character back to life. Like, she would still be alive in this series. Meanwhile, this is the one where it really starts to show that Paul Walker is no longer with us. Because they keep... Because Brian is still alive. Brian O'Connor is still alive in this series, and they keep mentioning Brian in this movie. And it's like, stop teasing us. I, I know you're not going to have Brian in this movie, because Paul Walker's dead. Like, it, you can't do that. You can't... You can't do that. Also, re real big surprise that Han came back when he's right on the fucking poster. The... Gee, I, I wonder if Han's gonna be in this movie. Hmm. Hmm, I can't figure it out. Although, Sean from Tokyo Drift did show back up, and I'm like, Oh, hey, Sean! Even though he's from my least favorite movie in the series, I'm still like... I, I just love it when franchises reference obscure characters within their own franchise. And, you know, like, Sean basically disappeared after the third movie, so the fact that he was in this was like, ah, Sean's back. I don't know, I thought it was nice. Uh, now I've been joking for a while that the tenth Fast and the Furious movie should be called Fast X and be set entirely in space. Partially just as a joke on how similar this franchise is to the, night, to the Friday the 13th series. But also because, you know, at some when, when franchises give up, it's always funny to have the in-space installment. And uh, F9 sets it up 
two characters go to space in this one very briefly, but uh, they, they do end up in space. So Fast X set the next movie entirely in space. Make it a space movie. Sci-fi Fast and the Furious. There's there's also a reference to the minions in this movie, which uh, is part of why I have ranked it lower than Furious 7. Ah, we come in peace! Pourquoi ah! est-ce qu'on dirait des... minions? Because, like, this came out last year. This, this is less than a year old, okay? You can't even act like that's a relevant joke anymore. The, the minions are not topical anymore. Please. So, Charlize Theron is the main character of the eighth movie. Main villain of the eighth movie. And she shows back up in this movie with the worst haircut I have ever seen. I mean, I get the daddy issues, but... Look at what you've built. They stop her plan in the eighth movie, but she gets away and it's like, ah, keeping her alive so you can keep the franchise going. But then she gets away at the end of this movie too, and you're like, is she just gonna be like the main villain now? Cause, cause it's been like, you've gone eight movies without a main villain. Why add one now? I don't know, it reeks of desperate, it reeks of like, oh uh, yeah, we're gonna keep the story going, you gotta keep watching to find out what happens to Shirley's Theron. I don't know, F9, it's got way too much going on. It's, it's, it's just noise at this point. It, this series is just noise. It's like, oh, here, look at this thing, look at that thing, look at this thing, look at that, it's so all over the place. It's it's just disorienting to watch. I don't like it. I didn't like F9. Moving on up the list. One Corona. So, Furious 7 takes placement over F9 for a couple reasons. It's, it's probably on equal footing quality wise the only things i give it for one thing i i really liked the uh the send-off for brian you know because because paul walker died and they end with this very nice tribute to him and his character and I, i'll admit i got a little emotional because i'm thinking about like oh man like <laughs> You know, Vin Diesel and these other guys, they've been making these movies with uh, uh, Paul Walker all this time, and, you know, he's passed away now, and it just, uh, it, it kind of got to me a little. I will say, uh, it seems like they got nearly everything they needed from him before he passed away, because the only part, the only part that felt like it was in any way, like, like, weirdly edited, weirdly tacked on, was just the very ending where he, you know, he races Dom and then they go their separate ways. And, and I don't say this to be disrespectful. Paul Walker's untimely death was nothing short of a tragedy. I'm very sorry for him and the people close to him. And I, I... I wish he was still here instead of having a good ending for his character. That said, Paul Walker's death is probably the best thing that could have happened to the fictional character Brian O'Connor. Because before this movie had even happened, they had set up that he and Mia were married and they have a child. And, like, it, it just seems increasingly ridiculous that they would have him going on these wild missions even when he's like a family man now. And then you know, you know if Paul Walker were still alive, they would still be shoving Brian into these movies. So, yeah, Brian is kind of lucky Paul Walker died. Not saying I wanted Paul Walker to die. I'm very sorry that happened, but... On the plus side, they kind of set up for removing him from the franchise already, so it's like, okay, well, at least his character got a happy ending. At the very least, his character got a happy ending. 
So the fifth and sixth movie sort of set a new tone for the series, uh, which was good. It was a much needed revamping to the series. Uh, and, but by seven, that revamping had started to feel kind of samey. This, this very much has that F9 problem of, like, too much going on. And it's just, like, a little repetitive once you've seen the other movies. So, uh, th this is sort of, the uh, like, with five, they hit a new high with the series. And that hype was kind of dying down by the seventh one. I, I do think they did a good job course correcting with eight. We'll talk about that when we get to it, but... Uh, Seven just feels like, I don't know, the backwash of Five and Six. It's like, ah, yeah, you liked Five and Six? Uh, here's Five and Six again. They they finally catch the timeline up with Tokyo Drift nearly ten years later, which just doesn't make any sense. Because f first off, they were referencing a bunch of, like, early 2000s culture, in, in Tokyo Drift, like, all of the music is from the early 2000s. All of the car models are, like, early 2000s cars. And second, when Dom shows up in Tokyo in this movie, it, it follows up on the, oh, a guy showed up, said Han was family ending to that movie. And so you, it shows the clip from the end of the movie, and then it shows Sean talking to, to Dom and, like, the actor is clearly, like, ten years older than he was in Tokyo Drift. You're like, no, th that dude is way older than the dude from Tokyo Drift. I don't know, it's it's just so silly to, like, to kill off Han and then, like, fuck with the timeline so that, like, he can still be in the fifth and sixth movie. It would have made more sense to say that, like, oh, he didn't actually die in the accident in part, uh, in Tokyo Drift. Which, of course, they went ahead and did in F9, so, like, I don't know, maybe use that twist sooner so that it makes more sense? I don't know. Th this is, like, the type of shit people talk about when they talk about, like, how stupid this franchise is. This movie does have Tej and Roman at their very gayest. Hey, Roman. You freaking out, ain't you? No. Yeah, you are. I said no. Listen, man, it takes a grown man to embrace his feelings. If you need to cry, <laughs> just go ahead and cry. As your friend, you know I'm concerned about your well-being. I always call him Roman. His name is Roman. He just pronounces it Roman in all of the movies, but for some reason I am compelled to call him Roman. Yeah, like, the homoerotic tension between them had been building, but this is the movie where it's just like, okay, these characters are fucking gay. You cannot convince me otherwise. They are dating. It does introduce Jason Statham's character, who is one of the best characters in the franchise. Although, he's, he's the villain in this movie... And then after this, he just becomes a good guy, because fuck it. <laughs> First off, he, uh, Jason Statham is just a really charismatic actor. He's, he's always fun to watch and stuff, and the character he plays in this is just a very fun character. <laughs> like, our introduction to him is, like, visiting his brother at the hospital. Because his brother was the villain in the last movie, and, like, a Dom and his gang beat the shit out of him. So he's visiting his brother in the hospital, and then he's, as he's walking out, you see that he's just, like, blown up half a building and killed everyone in it to come visit his brother in the hospital. Just ridiculous. Just a ridiculous character. I really love him. He is certainly the highlight of this movie. Um, that and the nice Paul Walker tribute at the end. But otherwise, this is just... I don't know. It's a silly, silly movie. Way too much going on, not very good, kind of repetitive, kind of just repeating the beats the, the fifth and sixth movie went over. But I don't know, it's it's not the worst thing. It's not the worst movie in the franchise. Uh, what is this? What Are we at five? Are we already halfway through this? Huh. Well, there you go. It's halfway up the list. Moving on. 
Fast and Furious presents Hobbs and Shaw, uh, a spin-off movie about Jason Statham and The Rock's characters from this franchise, neither of whom were in the first movie. Ni neither of whom were in the first four movies. Uh, the Rock doesn't show up till Fast Five, and uh, Jason Statham doesn't show up till Seven, and this is the movie where they team up to fight Idris Elba. And man, the power creep in this franchise is fucking crazy. Like, like Fast Seven, you were already going off the rails with Fast Seven because they were trying to steal this technology that was like the the. Dark Knight thing where you could see through everyone's camera phones. It, it's that technology. The bad, bad guys were trying to get a hold of that. So in this movie, there's like a whole organization of people who have like computerized, like, like mechanical body parts. They've been enhanced by robotics. Uh, and the, it's like this weird sort of cult thing where they think they're, they're the next movement in human evolution and they have to destroy all of the, the the lesser humans and they're planning on doing it with a super powered virus that was a great plot to go with in 2019 it's <laughs> like like the moment idris elba steps on screen and has like robot computer eye i'm like this franchise started with them stealing vcrs what the fuck? I will say, even in this spinoff that is distinctly like this spy action thriller, which is really what the franchise becomes after some point. It's like a spy thriller series. But this one is about a spy and like a, a former spy turned criminal kinda turned spy again because they need him for this case. Like, even in this one, they're like, well, the Fast and the Furious, it's the Fast and the Furious franchise, so there's gotta be some scenes of people driving cars. So, so there's a at least two car chases in this movie. That's, that's very nice. Helen Mirren plays, uh, Shaw, Shaw's mother, um, Jason Statham's mother. Uh, she's in actually quite a few of these. She, she, I think she first appears in 8, she might be in 7, but I think she first appears in 8, and then after that she's just like a recurring character, and I just love seeing Helen Mirren in these fucking Fast and the Furious movies. It's like, uh, good for her. And man, if I had a nickel for every movie with major plot points revolving around Pacific Islander culture in which Dwayne The Rock Johnson uses a hook as a weapon, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's interesting that it happened twice. Yeah, uh, this movie ends with, with Dwayne Johnson going back to the island of Samoa and, you know, uh, meeting up with his family there and they have to take down this, like, super tech organization. And it's sort of, it's sort of like a low tech versus high tech thing because all they have are, like, old spears and maces and stuff. Uh, not because they don't have guns in Samoa, but because Dwayne Johnson's mother has gotten rid of all the guns and only kept, like, the family heirloom old-school spears and maces and stuff. And he's like, well, I guess we're fighting with this. So it's like a low-tech versus high-tech thing. And, and that whole sequence is pretty fun, although there is this odd moment where, uh, like... The Rock's family starts doing this, like, Samoan war dance. And the bad guys all just, like, stand there and let them do it. We're sorry! Samoa! Kangeaku! Iliakua! Makaukau! Kua! Mole Malosi! I mean, they can't actually shoot them because, you know, Shaw's sister has deactivated all of their super robot guns. But at least try to shoot them. They're just standing there dancing. 
So, yeah, it's fun. There's stuff about it I enjoy. Um, by no means a, a perfect movie, but, you know, if you like the Fast and the Furious franchise, yeah, I mean, this is, this is sort of like the purest form of, like, late stage Fast and the Furious, because it's just about the spies. It's not even about street racers anymore. Um, although uh, it does sort of help the movie that they've, like, stepped away from the mainline franchise and just focused on these two specific characters in this one specific setting. And it's like, yeah, th there's too much bullshit going on in the Fast and the Furious franchise now. Like, a spinoff just about these two characters, it's like, yeah, keep it simple. Keep Make it smaller. Bring it in a little. Re reel it back. Just make a movie about two characters. Uh, interestingly, I would consider the two most charismatic characters, Dwayne The Rock Johnson and Jason Statham, are way better than, like, anyone in the Fast and the Furious main cast. Like, Vin Diesel, not a great actor. I hate to say it, I hate to speak ill of the dead, but, you know, Paul Walker, not a great actor either. Honestly, The Rock and Jason Statham are just super charismatic dudes, on the other hand. They make way more interesting leading men. Yeah, Hobbs and Shaw. It's, uh, one of the better ones. One of the more interesting ones, uh, at the very least. F eight of the Furious. Um, this one gets high placement just because it goes so balls out insane in so many places that, like, the submarine is the one everyone remembers. Right, there's, a, there's like a big chase scene with a fucking nuclear submarine. But there's so much other just completely insane bullshit that happens in this movie. Even the main plot, I think, is pretty interesting. Like, like I said, uh, the series had gotten kind of samey by the time they got to 7. Like, 7 just felt like a rehash of 5 and 6. So in this one... They find a, a brand new direction to go by making Dom the villain. Uh, Dom is working for the villain. He is working against the main crew. And that makes this movie way more interesting than some of the other installments. It's really weird, too, because for a while I'm like, are they going to have any explanation for this that is less stupid than hypnosis? And they did. They did have an excuse less stupid than hypnosis. But at the same time, I feel like they made it pretty obvious what direction they were going. Because, like, at the beginning of the movie, Letty's all like, Oh, Dom, you'd make such a great dad. And I'm like, okay, well, you've just confirmed that he is going to have a son by the end of this movie. And sure enough, uh, the love interest he had while Letty was dead had a son... That's, it's Dom's son, uh, and, and Charlize Theron has kidnapped the old love interest and her son, who is also Dom's son, and is forcing him to, to work with her so that, uh, he can have his son back, I suppose. Yeah, just, just complete insanity, complete, utter insanity. Honestly... This might be the best representation of, like, late series Fast and the Furious. I like 5 and 6 better. I think 5 and 6 are better movies. But this one is just so fucking dumb. This is just, like, n no thoughts, head empty. Let's do the dumbest, craziest shit we can think of. <clears throat> and, and so for that, I appreciate it. I appreciate... How absolutely ridiculous this movie gets. I I also appreciate that the name is almost a pun. It's it's F Fate of the Furious. Gotta love that. <laughs> Fate of the Furious. The the platonic ideal of a Fast and Furious movie. 
To Corona. Too fast, too furious. First off, amazing name. Like, uh, nowadays, Electric Boogaloo has sort of come back as the go-to goofy sequel title, but for a while there, it was Too Whatever, Too Whatever, because of Too Fast, Too Furious. Although, admittedly, uh, they're not as fast as they were in the first film, and I don't think they're as furious as they are in some of the other movies. I would not consider them too furious. Uh, this one gets pretty high placement where I have put most of the early films near the bottom because this one feels over the top and ridiculous while still being, like, pretty grounded, actually. Like, it's not like when the late series gets crazy and over the top. It's like a pretty grounded version of crazy and over the top. But it's still super fun. It's so much fun to watch. Dom does not return in this one. Instead, we see uh, Brian teaming up with uh, an, a, a friend of his that he has apparently, like, backstabbed in the past named Roman. It's also the introduction of Tej, played by Ludacris. And when he shows up, he has the most righteous afro I have ever seen. And then you never see Ludacris with an afro again. Not in this movie, not in any of the sequels. It's like, bring back Ludacris's afro. It was amazing. Also, Tej and Roman are both Roman. I keep, I keep saying Roman. Roman. Tej and Roman are so different in this movie than they are in the rest of the franchise. Roman less so, but, like, Tej in this is this, like, garage owner who, like, officiates street races and stuff. And he's all about, like, money and chicks and stuff. And then later in the series, he just becomes the tech guy. Like, after Fast Five, he's the tech guy. He's, he's the Donatello of the group. Which, which does not feel true to his character in this movie at all. Basically, uh, Brian and Roman are tasked with, like, catching the- like, they're working for this crime boss, and they're supposed to, like, figure out what evil shit he's pulling off, but instead they decide, oh, you know, we're gonna go off the record and, like, run off with all the money, run from the cops with the money, to run- run from the cops and from- this bad guy that they're taking all the money from. And and it culminates in Paul Walker driving a car off a bridge onto a boat. And I'm just like, yep, yes, this is what I want out of a Fast and the Furious movie. They, they immediately figured out what worked about this franchise and then immediately forgot what worked about this franchise until the fifth movie. <laughs> yeah, Too Fast, Too Furious. It, it's just a lot of fun. Uh, it, and, and it's a lot simpler than some of the later installments. It's, it really hits a sweet spot of being, like, ridiculous without being overcomplicated. I, I would consider it, uh, the franchise's first early success. Moving on to... Okay, so I don't actually know what the title of this is. The title card says Furious Six. But the poster, uh, the, the IMDb and the letterboxed, even this box set, call it Fast and Furious 6 and not Furious 6. So I'm pretty sure it's Fast and Furious 6, but the title card just says Furious 6. So I put this one above two for one and only one reason. In this movie, they show this giant fucking airplane. Where the hell does dude think he's going? We're on an army base, he's trapped! Wow, wow, you just had to open your mouth. Now we got a big-ass plane to deal with. That ain't a plane, that's a planet. And, and I said on Twitter, 
if they blow up this giant fucking airplane, I will put this higher than Too Fast, Too Furious. And they did. That is the only thing that puts this higher than Too Fast, Too Furious. Otherwise, the two are completely equal. Uh, but, you know, this, this one's a fun little, like, m movie where they have to, like, take down this crime lord because... Uh, in the previous movie, they encountered Hobbs, uh, the Rock's character, who's this, like, hard-ass FBI agent, and he's looking at this crew who keeps driving away super fast from, from incidents, and, and they've just blown up, like, uh, uh, the FBI building, I think. I think they blew up the FBI building. They blew up some important building that he was working at. And he's like, all right, I know exactly who we need for this job. The Toretto Gang. And, and of course, because they are still wanted for their actions in previous films, they agree to help him in exchange for, like, diplomatic... Uh, for, for, for pardons. If, if they can get pardoned, they'll do it. And, and he, he promises them that. So they they help him track down this criminal organization he's after. Which uh, it does start this sort of trend of each movie sort of building on the last. Like this, this one builds on five and then seven builds on this. Uh, eight doesn't really... I mean, I, I, guess, I guess the Shaw brothers show back up in this. Hmm. The Shaw brothers. Hmm. The Shaw Brothers show back up in 8, and then uh, Charlize Theron shows back up in 9. So, uh, from here on out, the franchise is sort of building on itself more than it was in previous installments. Yeah, it's it's fun. The action's really entertaining. Um, I, I gotta say, I, I had this fear that this franchise was gonna really suffer from its PG-13 ratings... And there was never a point in the series where it felt like they were holding back just for the sake of a rating. To be fair, I did watch the extended edition of some of these movies, but uh, even still, I, I feel like these were at least... Uh, none of Nothing happens in any of these that I think would warrant an R rating, except maybe some of the stuff in the extended edition of 5. So, uh, I mean, g g big ups to them for that. Uh, Furious 6, or Fast and Furious 6, uh, just, just a really entertaining movie. Just a, a movie that, it, it's, it's sort of the sweet spot in this franchise. 5 and 6 are, in case you haven't figured out what number 1 is, in case you can't do the math on your own. Five and six hit this sweet spot where they're, there's more going on than in the first couple of films, but they're not as overcomplicated as the last couple films. It's the the rare franchise that peaks right in the middle. Yeah, uh, Fast and Furious Six, it's one of the best. Uh, second only to. <laughs> It would seem as though I am not alone on this one. It seems like a lot of people think Fast Five is the best of the franchise. And for very good reason. It is the best of the franchise. So I, I think the thing that really stands out to people when they watch this is the climax. Uh, basically the whole movie they've been planning to like break into this police station and... Like, try to crack this safe and take all the money in it. And at some point, like, things escalate so far that they cannot possibly do that. But at that point, you know, they've helped out Dwayne The Rock Johnson, who, who's this FBI agent who's been chasing them down this whole time. He's been trying to arrest them. And then, uh, you know, this, this like, Brazilian crime lord attacks attacks them, attacks the, the convoy that is taking them to jail, taking them, oh, I guess back to America so they can be tried. Uh, he attacks the, the convoy, and the uh, Dom just comes over and, like, rescues the rock, saves the rock's life. 
in all of this. So the Rock is now on their side. And they're like, we're just going to kick down the door. We're going to hook up some chains to that safe. And we're going to drag it the fuck out of there. And they drag this safe all over town and just smash it into fucking everything. It's glorious. It's so glorious to see. It's, it's, it's just one of the best climaxes to any movie. If I were going to recommend one Fast and the Furious movie, it would be this one. And it would just be for that end scene. Where they're dragging the safe all over Rio, I guess. I think they're in Rio. All over Brazil. They, they show a shot of this, like, bank that has, like, all these glass windows. And it's like, oh, oh, don't fucking tempt me, man. Here comes the safe. Smashes all the fucking windows. And you're just like, yes. Yes, the collateral damage in this movie. Mm. The rest of the movie is fine. It's uh, it's interesting to see them like planning a heist movie, <laughs> or planning a heist in a Fast and the Furious movie. I guess they were kind of pulling off heists before this, but all involving cars. This the only thing that this involves with the cars is. They have to drive away quickly. That's that's what this has to do with cars. And then ultimately, they don't even have to drive away quickly because they end up driving away with a giant fucking safe tied to the back of their cars. It's just, it's so perfect. Like, it's, it's a movie that knows exactly what you want. It, it, it really plays with, like, audience expectations. It's like, you guys want to see something crazy? You guys want to see something fun? Huh? Come on. Fast Five. Just the absolute best this series has to offer. Which, of course, only leaves us with... Yeah, I watched the, the old, old Roger Corman-produced Fast and the Furious. Uh, I don't think Fast and the Furious 1 is a remake of this. I think that's just incidental overlap of title. Maybe maybe the 2001, 2002 movie is named after this, but the, the plots are not similar at all. This is about uh, a guy who's been convicted of murder and he's going to prison, but he like knocks over the prison bus and is on the run and he sort of kidnaps this woman so that he can take her car and they somehow end up getting registered in a race. Like, he registers the car in a race to, like, hide from the cops. Um, I'm not gonna talk about this for too long. Partially because this is not what you're here for and partially because this movie is really boring. Like... Compared to Tokyo Drift, I, I would rather watch Tokyo Drift, and I put Tokyo Drift at the bottom of this list. So if I were going to rank this with all of the other movies, it would be dead last. I did not enjoy this film. But, you know, how many other people are going to talk about The Fast and the Furious 1953 in their Fast and the Furious breakdown, huh? No one. Just me. I, I just want you to know how much these drunk ranking videos have affected my year-end stats on Letterboxd. My top actors of the year were Jim Varney, the man who played Ernest, and Warwick Davis, the man who played the Leprechaun. In fact, uh, tied for third place with Peter Cushing, the girl from Sister Street Fighter, and uh, Donald Pleasance is Paul Walker. Because of the Fast and the Furious movies. Also, my top directors for the year were John R. Cherry, the director of all but one of the Ernest movies, and uh, Justin Lin, the one who directed all of the Fast and the Furious movies, who directed a bunch of the Fast and the Furious movies, not all of them. So, so yeah, that, that's the effect this has had on my Letterboxd stats. Um, Fast and the Furious is maybe a franchise that is more interesting to talk about in the broader sense than it is any specific movie in it. 
I'm really surprised no one has done, a, like, a video essay breaking down sort of the political implications of this series. It, it's a series with, like, really strong diversity, but both, like, racial and ethnic diversity, and, and the, the women are as much a part of the story as the men are. They, they are just as important, well, maybe not just as important, but they, they're a big part of this series uh, as much as the men are. Uh, and, uh, there's, there's a neurodivergent character in the first film. Granted, he gets killed and there's not really another one, but that's something. There, there is a neurodivergent character in this series. And if you want LGBT representation, you've got Tej and Roman. What about my steps? What am I supposed to be doing? No, we didn't miss anything. They're special teams. So when we need you, do what you do best. And that is? Shine brightly like only roman pierce can do <laughs> this is like one of the biggest franchises of all time and it has like better representation than like the mcu or star wars it's also interesting when compared to the other franchises i've talked about because there is definitely a future to the fast and the furious franchise i, I know there's been a paranormal activities movie since i did my video about it but you know what i'm not gonna watch it you didn't know about it. I didn't either until someone commented on that video that they were about to release another one. And I'm like, fuck that, man. Like, it, it was a Paramount Plus exclusive. So that kind of tells you how much hype there was for another Paranormal Activity movie. As for the future of the Fast and the Furious franchise, it seems like Vin Diesel really wants to wrap it up with the 10th movie. Um, and hopefully that works out. Although I, I could see, I could see them doing like a, a closing the book on the whole franchise 10th movie and then having like spinoff movies. I really want a Tej and Roman movie. Please give me a Tej and Roman spinoff. Also, I, I feel like inevitably there's going to be a movie about... Dom's son and Brian's son facing off in some capacity. Um, and, and maybe even, like, a prequel movie? Because F9 had a bunch of, like, flashbacks to, to Dom's teenage years. It's very much the Godfather Part 2 of the Fast and the Furious franchise. So maybe they'll just do a whole prequel movie. But yeah, I mean, they could go any direction with this franchise and it wouldn't surprise me, honestly. Like, it, this is just like a franchise that can do whatever it wants. Whatever direction they go with the next movie, it will make as much sense as anything else they've done. It, it is a series with a bit of a reputation for being, like, dumb trash. And I get why, but at the same time, I don't know if that's totally fair. Maybe, maybe for, like, the, the more recent movies, like 7, 8, and 9, if you want to say those are just, like, trashy fun, fine. But, now there's some of these movies that I really like. As for you fucking people, I put this in a poll with, with Paranormal Activity, and you guys picked Paranormal Activity. And I gotta say, there is not a single movie in the Fast and the Furious franchise that is worse than than the best Paranormal Activity movie. This franchise is better in every way than Paranormal Activity. So fuck you people for picking the wrong thing. Anyways, I'm putting the next drunk ranking to a vote. So we could do either the Police Academy series from the 80s, because my god, there were so many fucking Police Academy movies. Or, I picked up this box set of the Bring It On movies. There's six of them. I didn't realize there were six fucking Bring It On movies. I thought there were like two and then a straight to video one. There's six. There's six Bring It On movies. So that's your options for next time. Police Academy or Bring It On. As always, follow me at Matt underscore presents if you want to see me drunk tweet these movies in real time. Uh, after this, I'm going to take a bit of a break. Um, 
I'm honestly about to take a bit of a break from alcohol in general, just to sort of, for my health. When I come back, I, I do need to do Venom, Let There Be Carnage, but I think that's the only movie I have before I dive into my next series. So, um, you know, go ahead and vote. Bring It On versus the Police Academy series. Um, I guess that's all I have to say. I'm gonna finish this Corona so I don't have to open another one. That is some shitty fucking beer, my dude.